Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back to Espresso and Kabbalah, where we meditate on some Kabbalah with a sip of espresso. Where's your espresso? <laughs> L'chaim. Feel free to have. Cheers. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shachol Miyavadar. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning in and being with us here this morning. So today we are up to chapter 5 in the Practical Tanya, which is the Alter Rebbe's Tanya, um, where we develop and explore core concepts in Kabbalah and how to apply them into our own everyday human lives. So I invite you all to open up the Practical Tanya if you have this book at home or you can buy it online. It's a wonderful resource. Um, the Tanya is by Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi and this book is adapted by Rabbi Chaim Miller who has done a wonderful job helping us apply Tanya to our everyday experience. So here we are. Um, chapter... Four, sorry, chapter five, and that is on page 75 of the book. So let's all get settled. Take a moment to thank yourself this morning for showing up, opening up a book, delving into Torah study, being here, and that's always something to be grateful for to yourself. So thank you, thank yourself for showing up, sitting down, opening up your mind, and preparing to add some Torah and Kabbalistic Hasidus and philosophy into your everyday life. So last week we discussed at the end of chapter four all about a mitzvah. And a mitzvah, as we know, is a godly commandment, right? Imagine a general in the army. He commands his troops, and they must obey. That is what a commandment is. And if you look at Torah and Judaism and life as just like this dry, you know, there's someone in charge, there's a boss, he's giving me orders, this is what I must do. Some people relate to their Yiddishkeit and their Judaism in that way, but it can be a little dry and it can lack that like fresh meaning and excitement that comes into our life when we have more purpose and emotion involved. So the Alter Rebbe is teaching us a mitzvah is not just a commandment, there's actually another meaning of the word tzivoy, which is commandment, which is safta v'chibor. A mitzvah is a connection, right? Just like when I reach out and grab the hand of my friend and I give a hug to someone I love, I'm connecting with them. A mitzvah is a connection with the divine. It is a moment where little me and my creator, who is so great and so lofty and so grand and created the entire universe, right, from the stars and the galaxies to my little cup of coffee espresso today, that God and little me can have a, a bond, a connection and a hug. So we talked about how a mitzvah is, is not just like a heavy rock and a burden that I'm putting in a bag and shouldering and, oi, a mitzvah, oi, a commandment, oi, my life is full of these rules and restrictions and laws and uh, it's so hard, it's such a schlep. But no, we say a mitzvah is a diamond and we say every mitzvah is another treasure that I'm collecting in my bag. So even if I'm holding a big bag of diamonds, I'm like, I feel light as a feather. I'm, I'm alive, I'm awake, I'm alert, I feel so in tune with my surroundings because I'm enjoying my life. I'm finding pleasure in what I do. And that's what Hashem wants from us. Hashem wants us to enjoy our lives. Hashem wants us to jump into our day, and it says in the Code of Jewish Law, wake up like a lion. Like literally, pop, I used to tell my siblings when I'd wake them up for school, pop out of bed <laughs> like a piece of toast jumping out of a toaster. Pop, like, you know, a lion gets up with a roar, ready to take on his day. That's how Hashem wants us to embrace and jump into our lives. Like, 
a tall glass of water on a thirsty day, just like delicious, geschmack. There's a song that says, it's geschmack to be a Yid. What does that mean? It's enjoyable to be a Jew. It's enjoyable to celebrate Hashem's mitzvahs and to bring godliness into our lives and into our relationships. And if you follow and subscribe to Danny and Razel Namdar, our brother and sister-in-law, um, they follow, they have a channel called That Jewish Family, and they live this concept of it's geschmack to be a yid, it's so much fun, let's jump around and dance and celebrate and do the mitzvahs in a way that is exciting and enjoyable. And that gives Hashem the biggest nachas ruach, which means pride and joy. So l'chaim, to being enjoying our lives, that it's geschmack, exactly, geschmack to be a yid, that we should have celebration, a celebration of our everyday, that life should be like a drink of fresh water and really special um, to live that way. So l'chaim. <laughs> Chaim, got espresso? Yeah? <laughs> Grab one. We have to make some more espresso. Um, L'chaim, Morasara, thank you. Morasara is a librarian. She is an incredible donor to the Chabad of Singer Island and the Beaches Library. We have so many beautiful books from you, so thank you for adding so much joy to our children and all the children who come through. We're loving the books. Thank you. So if last week we discussed that a mitzvah is so geschmack, so enjoyable, it's a hug, no matter how many layers of clothing, like it says in the Tanya, the king can be wearing robes and garments, or like we give a hug to someone and they're wearing a bunch of ski jackets, it doesn't matter how many layers are covering them, it's a hug, right? You're connecting with that person. So in this week's lesson, we're actually discussing Torah study, as opposed to doing a mitzvah. So there's something unique about opening up Torah and actually saying the words out loud, it says that the breath of the Torah study creates like divine light and emanations that surround you and bring holiness into your life. So what we're doing today, we're studying Bechavruta, we're reading the Torah out loud, we're reading texts of Hasidic philosophy out loud, that brings a certain special connection to God into our lives beyond just being absorbed by Hashem's light and giving Him a hug there's an even deeper unity that we're going to discover that comes about through Torah, Torah study, Torah learning. So let's dive right into the text. Chapter 5, Total Immersion in the Divine, an Unparalleled Unity with God. Do you have the page? Bottom of page 75. So why does Torah study offer a more like intense connection and unity with Hashem? Let's clarify in more depth the term grasp. In Elijah's statement in the Zohar, no thought can grasp you at all. What does it mean that no thought can grasp Hashem? So when you understand something, turning to page 76, you own it, right? And it becomes absorbed in your mind. If I open up a book and I study it, it becomes part of me. It's like I digest it into my brain and it becomes part of my psyche, part of my physical being. So the Tanya is suggesting that there's something implied by the term grasping. No thought can grasp God at all. What does this mean? So now when your mind processes and masters an idea, your mind initially grasps the basic point of the idea, mentally engulfing it. So what happens when you imagine a sponge in a puddle of water? If you drop a sponge in a puddle of water, it will soak it all up, right? It absorbs the surroundings. So, so too, when we understand something, we like soak it in like a sponge. So that's the first stage. We've absorbed a basic idea. And now that we have absorbed it, our mind is intrigued and we want to master the logic of the idea and we want to analyze and fully grasp the idea. And we'll continue in the text. And after 
Exactly. Chabad. Chachma bina da'as, which is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. This is the process of using our intellectual powers and capacities to really get something, right? And we all know that feeling of like, I want to get this. I'm going to study it. I'm going to use, apply all of my logic and I'm going to get this idea. So we can really apply our minds. After it has been thoroughly analyzed by the mind, an idea becomes fully grasped and absorbed in your mind that figured the idea out and mastered it. So it's like becomes absorbed into the mind, almost like a visual of like the information goes into your mind and it's like sponged, absorbed, soaked up. Vigam. And there is another dimension. L'chaim. L'chaim to Chabad. Using your wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. <laughs> Cheers. It's quite a frigid morning in Singer Island in the 60s, going up into the 70s. So we're experiencing a bit of chill while a lot of other places are getting snow. Um, here in Florida, we're getting some fresh breeze. <laughs> so it's a good morning to make an espresso or a cocoa or a tea, whatever you like to sip on. So what does this mean? We're, we're grasping an idea. There's something that takes place between the time when you initially grasp an idea and, the, and your final mastery of it. So let's say you decide to learn a language, right? So you'll, okay, I'm going to learn this language. You decide to do it. And then before you fully know and are fluent in the language, there's a, a an, what's it called? Like a time when you, the word is losing, I'm losing the word. What's the word when you like get used to something slowly? It like becomes part of your life, you know, step by step by step. I'll get it in a few minutes. So what does this mean? Because during the interim time, when your mind is processing the initial idea, attempting to fully grasp it, then the reverse is true. So yes, you are absorbing the information and your mind is like trying to grasp it, but it's also that your mind is absorbed in the idea because it is captivated by it. So it's like my sister just moved to Brazil. Shout out to Bossy Whiteman and Bossia. She's trying, she has a Portuguese lesson, right? So she's studying the language in Brazil. So you can try to grasp the idea, but while you're delving into that subject matter and while you're studying that subject, the idea is also captivating you. So it's like a double unity. Like you're in it, it's surrounding you, you're like completely absorbed and invested in this information. And if we apply the concept that Torah is God's wisdom, there's something very special going on here when we study Torah. There's something going on which is our wisdom and God's wisdom are being like completely unified in a level that is so much deeper than let's say a hug where I hug you, you hug me. We're like two individuals who embrace and have a bond. This is like a complete unity where we're on the same page, literally and figuratively. So until you've mastered the idea, right? You're trying to study Portuguese or whatever you're trying to accomplish. Um, it captivates you. You're absorbed in the idea. And as soon as you've mastered it fully, it kind of ceases to captivate you since you've absorbed it. At that point, the idea is absorbed in you. It's like a piece of bread that you've eaten and is now digested, and it's part of your nutrition, it's part of your blood. Like, once you get it, it's in you. Like, you've gotten it, you're one with it. It's impossible to separate from it. You've studied it, you've grasped it, you're one with it. So now, when an idea is studied from a Torah text, right? As you master a Torah text, your soul is absorbing divine light. It's one with Hashem. And this connection with God is so nourishing. It's so, you're so absorbed in divinity, right? You're, it says like you're absorbed in God and he's absorbed in you, so to speak. It's like digging into a piece of Torah study is like nourishing your soul like food. So as we discussed at our women's program, we had like a new moon women's gathering at the beginning of the month. We just started the new month of Shvat, of January. So it was part of our discussion that this food is about the sense of 
taste and nourishment and like a tree we taste from the tree and we talked all about like food and different um, intentions for the month when you eat something it literally nourishes you and it becomes one with you so that's why Torah is described as food because when you study something it nourishes you so what did we discuss I just got back to it. what did we discuss at the women's program that if you find yourself opening up the refrigerator like okay I'm hungry like you open up the fridge, you're not hungry. You go back, you open the fridge, I'm not hungry. You look around your kitchen for a snack, but you're not hungry. And you just keep going back and forth to look for food. It's actually, it's said that that means your soul is craving Torah knowledge. It means your soul is hungry for a different kind of sustenance. Sometimes we're hungry for food, but like, we're not hungry for food. What do we find ourselves searching for? It's actually to nourish our souls, to give our soul a yummy piece of babka, to give our soul a delicious, nourishing bowl of soup, to give our soul that cozy feeling of like, I just came home, it's been a long, cold day, and I'm like eating something nourishing and delicious, comfort food. Sometimes our soul wants comfort food. Sometimes our soul wants us to take a book off the shelf and just like absorb our minds and let our mind be absorbed with this like double unity that we're discussing in like this delicious like soul food. I'm gonna learn something, I'm gonna be satiated by it. And when you study a piece of the Torah portion or Psalms, Tehillim, Tanya, any, any Torah text, it could be the prophets, it can be anything that's captivating your imagination or interest, halacha, like code of Jewish law, how to go about your life as a Jew, how to go about your everyday, Anything that you um, throw yourself into and you throw your mind and your energy and your spirit and connection, then when, you're, when, you, when you close the book and you're done for the day with that portion, it's like, it's like the food that became part of your system. Like you're so nourished and it feeds you. You know, sometimes you can like read a book or a magazine or something interesting and you're like satiated, like you're fed. That's because knowledge and Torah knowledge especially really becomes one with you. So that's why we have to really delve into holy words and texts that feed us because you are what you eat, right? So whatever you throw yourself into and whatever you try to absorb on a daily level, whatever you feed yourself, if you're looking at news outlets that feed you, that make you happy, um, if you're looking at sources of information that bring you good vibes and good feelings. Hi, good morning. That is what's going to give you a healthy, nourishing um, source of information. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Espresso and Kabbalah. Thank you. Cheers. Yes, yeah, smell, taste, feel. Hi. So, hi, everybody online and in person. Hi. Thank you. Welcome everybody. We just started chapter 5, page 75. We're on page 76. I'm um, starting page 77. How's it going? Good, day. good, good. Welcome. Everybody, do you want a Tanya? Do you have a Tanya? Everybody has a Tanya. Beautiful. So we're in the practical Tanya. You need to make a Shakyana. <laughs> Very special that you have a new book. Wow, I'm so glad you bought it. I hope it brings you many joyful days of learning together. Amazing. We have Rue or Peppy. Hi, Rue. <laughs> Our Hasidus Peppy in residence. Yes, so thank you for pointing out online. We're discussing you are what you eat, right? And Torah study is compared to mazon, is compared to food. And if we immerse ourselves with delicious, yummy, kosher sources of sustenance, kosher food, kosher books, kosher environment, very well said, thank you. Um, that gives our, we become very refined and holy and it really becomes us who we are. So as we become captivated by a Torah text and our mind is completely absorbed in its information and we have a desire to master it, like sometimes we desire to learn a language or we desire to learn how to dry or how to do something fun, we completely throw ourselves into that process and our soul becomes absorbed in divine light, dressing it like a garment. L'chaim. <laughs> Espresso and Kabbalah. Thank you, thank you. Cheers. 
לוי וולן? כן. לחיים. לחיים, So as we discussed last week, a mitzvah is a garment of the soul. It like gives you a new um, outfit in your wardrobe because you clothe yourself in divine light. It washes around you as you light a Shabbat candle, as you reach out and do a kind deed, a favor for a friend. That washes around you like a divine aura, a divine light. Torah study is both. There's a certain advantage that we discuss in, that the Altar Rebbe teaches us in chapter 5 of Tanya. The advantage of Torah study, it offers a very deep connection because it's dressed like a garment in divine light, but it's also, it's not just surrounding us, it's like within us because it becomes part of our minds. It soaks into us like a sponge. So let's continue in the text on page 77. Derech mashal, by way of illustration. Kisha'adam meven umasig eza halacha b'mishnah abegemara. And you can follow along in the text at the top of the page, which is just solid tanya, or on the bottom where it explains and translates. Le'ashura al buria. When you are in the process of analyzing and fully mastering a ruling of the Mishnah or Gemara, your intellect progressively grasps and engulfs the ruling. So remember we talked about like soaking it in, absorbing all its details and ramifications. And yet at the same time, your mind is absorbed in it and captivated by it. So you're grasping it, but you're also completely like captivated and surrounded by it. So like when you learn a language we discussed, you are studying the information, but you're also so interested and it's completely like surrounding like an aura. And the altar of it writes, like the text is right here, that this ruling of the Talmud, this piece of Torah information, wisdom, represents the wisdom and will of the Blessed Holy One. So it arose in his will what the final, final ruling would be when, for example, Reuven will present a particular legal argument and Shimon a counter argument. So the Talmud and the Mishnah, these texts are full of mundane examples. What happens if this person bothers this person or the modern day equivalent of a car accident, my ox bothered your ox, so that they had an altercation. So there's so many laws of hypothetical things that may or may not happen and how to deal with it. What does the Torah law say? How much do I owe you if something happens to me or to you and the emotional damage and all of those monetary laws and there are pages and pages and pages of Torah texts. Just understanding the Torah law the practical halachic ruling of what happens when certain things occur, that is divine will and wisdom. That, studying that text and absorbing it and understanding what to do in different situations that may or may not ever happen, that's absorbing divine will and wisdom into your mind. You become literally one with the divine as you're sitting and studying this Torah. Well, at the same time, you're being captivated and absorbed by it as we said, it, it, this is a very powerful union with God. It's like in every direction. Even if you study Torah that has no seeming practical relevance, does it still represent the will and wisdom of God? The Alter Rebbe asks. In the bottom of page 77, Even if the scenario never came to pass, right? It's a hypothetical conversation. And it never will be. And there will never be actual litigation involving these particular legal arguments and claims. Nevertheless, since it arose in the will and wisdom of the Blessed Holy One, what the final ruling would be if one person would present a certain legal argument and the other corresponding counter argument. And I'm sure those of us who are involved in the legal system can understand how detailed and almost nitty-gritty these like back and forths can be. 
right? The Torah law goes through so many examples and practical applications. If it follows that when you understand this ruling with your mind, when a person contemplates and meditates on these situations, as the law is prescribed, page 78, by the Mishnah, Gemara, or the later authorities, you would thereby understand, grasp, and engulf with your mind the wisdom and will of the Blessed Holy One. So this is not a regular legal textbook that you are studying, my friends. This, because it is God's will and how Hashem wants the world to run, you know, we always ask ourselves, how do, what does Hashem want from me? What do I do in this situation? Like, how do I know what's the right way to proceed? Is this what God wants for me? Is this going to lead to a more just, peaceful, kind world of peace and loving kindness and harmony and just learning how to be nice to one another? That's like the main Torah law, right? Love your fellow as yourself. It's the most integral part of Torah is to be kind, to, you know, treat another person with respect and love and kindness the way you want to be treated, right? So that Torah that teaches us how to be kind and how to be loving, it teaches us how to run our lives, how to have just and moral societies, how to have societies where everyone's rights are taken care of, where everyone is completing their obligations, where everyone is treating one another the way that they're meant to be treated. When we live in a world like that, that's run by God's wisdom, and we study the Torah, which is God's wisdom, we become so united with Hashem and it purifies our homes and our hearts and it's a ripple effect. It spreads everywhere. You know, one person sitting and studying in a book and even we're going to discuss the special quality of saying it out loud, meaning studying the chavrata, studying the chavrusa, where you break your brains with a friend over a text and you really try and like, what does this mean? Like, you really um, pour your effort into that moment of like, how can I understand this and bring it into my life? Do I really understand it? Can I apply my knowledge and my logic further? That process has a ripple effect of bringing divine light into the whole universe, right? Am I right? I have a Torah scholar here today, <laughs> my brother Levi, um, a visiting yeshiva student joining our espresso and Kabbalah. So is that correct to say that when you study Torah, you purify the whole world? Yeah. Tell, can you tell us a little bit about your studies? <laughs> And what are you learning these days? Um, learning to this, Tanya. Um, yeah. This is the real stuff, the Tanya. Exactly. Is there anything you're learning in like the halachic? Yes, I'm learning um, smita, learning the laws of milk and meat, the mixing. Very interesting. And uh, <laughs> very practical. It is practical. So, Rabbi Levi Techtel visiting um, my brother. He is studying the laws of milk and meat, which is so practical. You know, it says in Jewish law, do not, um, what's the phrase? Boil. Don't boil a calf in its mother's milk. Yes, exactly. A calf in its mother's milk. So there's this humanity involved where we're not going to enjoy a meal that has you know, meat together with milk, which, you know, one is life-giving and one is a different process. <laughs> um, so there's a certain humanity and respect involved in the laws of kashras, but they're so detailed. Don't have milk and meat like this, don't have milk and meat like that, and we're all at our own journey with kosher food and kosher eating, and we're all striving every day, and every bite of kosher is another mitzvah. Every step that we take is another um, purifying and refining. You know, kosher means fit. It means like very refined. A lot of people eat kosher just because it's so, the ingredients are so stringently, um, you know, like you're not allowed to like put ingredients in a, an item that has a kosher label. There aren't allowed to be unlisted ingredients. So everything is very pure, very clean. A lot of people enjoy kosher for that purpose. Um, even non-Jews enjoy eating kosher because it's very humanely, um, you know, the whole process is, is very kind and focused on respect for the body and for the, you know, all the, all the life that goes into it. 
So these laws can be yeah, very, yeah. very kept kosher because oh wow so that you had friends who kept kosher who yeah, weren't they, Jewish. they were devout catholic family but oh they gosh. said that it, it because it was kosher it somehow had to have been holier they didn't understand mm. why but they just said right. it must be holier because it's it has like a, a it's marked with like a sign from mm -hmm. god so they, they yeah. only ate kosher food Wow, but that's they, amazing. Jewish. Oops, exactly yeah, so kosher food has a lot of um, interesting laws connected to it. We don't understand all of them. It's a lot of it is like very beyond logic. Um, some people think kosher is just like, oh, Rabbi blessed it, but no, there's like a whole intricate set of laws that determine whether or not something is kosher, and that's a whole conversation for itself. But for today's conversation, studying the laws connects you with Hashem. Um, on page 78, we'll jump back into the words of the Alter Rebbe and the Tanya. As we've explained in the previous chapter, the Zohar states, No thought can grasp him, not his will, nor his wisdom, since no finite immortal can grasp something infinite. Yet the exception to this rule is that when some when divine wisdom and will is dressed in the final rulings of Jewish law, which have been codified for us. So what we have learned is that God compacted his infinite wisdom and will into the finite garb of these Torah laws. So what does this say? That no thought can grasp God at all. Like our thought and God's thought, different, completely different realities. Like we can't even begin to compare our understanding to God's understanding like when God speaks the world is created when God says let there be light there's a world so how can we compare our thought and our speech to God it's impossible but there's one exception when we study the rulings of Jewish law when we open up a Torah text and study it Bible study the Parsha of the week any form of Torah we're literally that is when we're able to grasp God's wisdom and will in no other circumstance are we able to grasp God's wisdom. It's too lofty. It's too divine. Vigam, as we have seen, not only does your mind absorb the divine laws through study, but also the reverse is true. Your mind becomes absorbed in them and is captivated by them. So what is it like to have this process? For your mind to be absorbed and engulfed by the divine, and at the same time, have the divine totally absorbed within you. This is a phenomenal merging experience. This is a phenomenal unity of two beings. There is no other merging experience like it, says the Alter Rebbe. Nothing remotely comparable exists in the physical world where you become completely one with another entity from every conceivable perspective and yet retain your own existence. So physically, it's impossible to have this kind of like inside out unity. Like to, But when you study the Torah, that's precisely what happens. You engulf the Torah, you master it, and it engulfs and it captivates you. Um, is there a phenomenal like experience of some other, like when we study other wisdom, like a secular law book or a mathematician kind of style, like, you know, some other text of secular wisdom, do th does that happen when we study other wisdom? Right? It seems like the mind operates that way. Like when I study, I study. When I study Portuguese, when I study math, when I study science, my mind is doing this phenomenal like merging experience where I'm grasping information and it's engulfing my and captivating my mind. However, there's a key distinction and it says that in this book. When you study astronomy, for example, and you're completely captivated by the stars and the planets and what's going on, you do not become one with the planets themselves, <laughs> right? You don't start like the constellations don't like absorb into your soul. Your mind unites with the concept of the planets, right? Or the math at matter, like the subject matter at hand, whatever you're studying. There remains an inherent duality between the idea and its subject, okay? On the other hand, 
when God looked into the Torah and created the world, right? It says that in the Zohar, Istaka baraisa ubara alma. God looked into the Torah and created the world. The Torah is therefore the blueprint of creation itself. So we're not talking about a regular math book here. We're not talking about regular wisdom and understanding. When you study something in the Torah, that thing is a direct product of the idea as it exists in the Torah. So therefore, there's this phenomenal like merging experience. It's different. It's a very special unity that only exists because the Torah is the blueprint for humanity. So like one time we gave the example about a dishwasher. If you want to learn how to properly run a dishwasher, what are you gonna, where are you going to consult? You're going to look at the manual. Who made it? How does it work? What do the buttons mean? Like, I don't want to break it, right? I want to press the right thing at the right time. So we look at the manual. So too, the Torah is something that we consider the manual for creation, the blueprint. How do I have a peaceful life? How do I have successful relationships? How do I have peace in my day? How do I have success at work? How do I, you know, have a happy family? How do I find meaning and purpose? How do I have success in every area of my life and blessing and health and happiness? I can look for the ideas, like I can s travel the globe and try to search for the answers, or I can look in the Torah, which is the manual, the blueprint. This is how to have a meaningful, purposeful, godly driven, godly inspired, meaningful life. So opening up the Torah is really kind of like opening up the manual to planet Earth, to this galaxy, to this universe. And when we open up that manual and we study what it says inside, this is what to do when um, something happens in the practical law with this legal argument and this claim. It's like bringing it to life. It's like popping out of the text into our actual everyday lives. And that's why there's this phenomenal experience of studying Torah, because it's like studying the brain of creation, the blueprint of reality. Moving on to section two, it's right there on the middle of page 79, and we're going to run through the rest of the text of chapter five. Um, Vizayis, any questions? We'll do questions at the end, but in the meantime, everybody online good? Feel free to drop a question in the box and we'll answer it. Um, this is the endlessly great and wonderful advantage possessed by the mitzvah of knowing and mastering the Torah over all those other mitzvahs that involve action. Even those mitzvahs connected with speech since there are mitzvahs that involve speaking. It's a type of action. In fact, knowing and mastering the Torah with your mind has an advantage even over the mitzvah of verbalizing the Torah which you study. So there's this mitzvah of knowing the Torah, just sitting and reading the book. That is a great uh, advantage over any action that we can do. And, and you know, sometimes the Tani will say that there's an advantage to doing the deed, right? Hamaisa hua ikr, get it done, action is the main thing. And sometimes, you know, shivim panim la Torah, we're going to focus on the fact that knowledge and understanding and getting the whys of what we do is the advantage. So don't fret if you hear something on one page and something on another because they're all explaining different facets of like the hows and the whys. It's good to understand like the value of each individual element. So today we're discussing the element of Torah study and the value that Torah study brings. Ki al yadei kol mitzvah she bedibur umaisa. Since with all the mitzvahs involving speech or action, a kadosh baruch hu malbish es anav hashem makipa or hashem, there is a one-way absorption of the person into the divine. Right, the soul is absorbed in God and surrounded by the light of God. May reisha ad ragla from head to foot. So when we light that Shabbat candle, or when a man dons to fill in in the morning, there's this godly glow, and you're just like suffused with light, and it really surrounds and brings radiant light into your life. But with a mitzvah of knowing the Torah, so there's this additional element where we're absorbed in divine wisdom, right? It's like just completely loses itself, like, oh my gosh, I'm just studying right now. I'm not thinking about anything else but 
this page in front of me. The divine wisdom is like absorbed into this egoic mind is written, that, that sense of self. Like when you're reading something, when you're studying something, you're not like asking questions or thinking about how it relates to you. For one moment, it's just pure absorption like a sponge. Afterwards, you know, you reflect, you ask questions, you apply, you think, but there are moments in Torah study where it's just absorbing information. And we all relate to that when we study. First we absorb, then we, you know, chew it over. Masha Seho Masi Gutaifes Hairu, our puppy. Um, how is he? He's okay? Um, the type is umakif the sikha, masha efshar, laila twice lahasik, me dia satara. As your mind gra masters, grasps, and absorbs whatever Torah knowledge you are able to absorb and master. So you, you soak it all in when you study Torah. That's what we're saying. Page 80. Um, we'll read this section and then we'll explain. So the capacity to fill the being with divine light, um, it's limited, right? Each person according to his own powers. When I read a text or when my friend reads a text, we're each kind of grasping it differently. Like, you know, we don't all, we all have different minds, different personalities, different experiences. So we understand things in different ways. Um, and if you remember in the first Espresso and Kabbalah, we introduced this entire fundamental book of Tanya as the garden of Torah. So there's Pshat, Remez, Drush, and Sod. If you walk through the orchard, you have the literal text, you have the allegorical text, the hinting text, um, the stories, the numerical values, all, and the mystical element. All of these are the garden of Torah. So when you walk through, you might be drawn to the story element of Torah study, and you might be drawn to the numbers and the mathematical, like, um, gematrias, like those equations that make, you know, some people very excited. And you might be drawn to the mystical element of what's really going on here and what's the secret hidden divine light. And you might be drawn to the pshat. What happened? What's the story? Tell me the text. What happened to Noah? and the ark with the animals. So we all like are lit up by a different element of Torah study. And that's okay, because we're all different, right? Everyone's a different piece of the puzzle that makes us one. Even though each one of us has like a different capacity to study and like absorb different things. Um, the Torah is absorbed in the soul and the mind is engulfed by them. So even though like we all have a different way of understanding it, in the mitzvah of knowing Torah is like absorbed, like bread, like food. It's alluded to in the Torah, like eating a piece of food. You take it in. It just digests within you. And that is why the Torah is called bread and food of the soul. Just as physical bread nourishes the body only when it's absorbed inside you. And it only keeps you alive after it has been transformed into blood and flesh of your flesh. Same is true with the soul's knowledge and mastery of Torah. So what happens when we absorb food? It gives us life, right? We study the Torah, it gives us nourishment, we focus our mind to the point where we're one with it, right? You eat something, it's part of you. You are what you eat. You study a piece of Torah, it's part of you. It's absorbed by your intellect, it's, it's merged, and that provides a nourishment and life for the soul. The nasa mazan la nefesh, right? We said sometimes when we're hungry, but we're not like actually like finding comfort with food, like or, or nourishment or sustenance, like it doesn't we're full, like we're we're hungry but we're full. What is it? What's what do we need to be satiated by? The soul is nourished, right? By Torah study. And life for it. 
on the Lubash B'chachmas of Etarasa Shebikirba, which is dressed in his wisdom as Torah. So, we discussed that Torah is nourishing to the soul. It's bread and it's food. And this is the meaning of the verse, B'zehu shakasu v'tarascha b'saych me'ai. Your Torah is in my, in my guts, <laughs> in my system. It's like, I've studied it to the point where it's part of me. Like, I, there's no separation anymore. I've eaten it, absorbed it, digested it. Um, like, who wouldn't want that kind of unity with Hashem? So, kind of like the advantage we're discussing today is like, we can give Hashem a hug by doing a mitzvah, which is like two different like people who love each other, giving each other an embrace. Or we can like become so united and so connected with our divine creator, so unified and like so at peace that it's like, you know, there's a unity here that can never be found with anything else. Right? <laughs> um, so there's another section at the end of this chapter. Um, it discusses how Torah study affects the souls in the afterlife. So you know how we said, like, when a soul passes on, <clears throat> it's very uh, difficult for us to say goodbye. And um, my grandfather's yard site is tomorrow. It's going to be the first yard site of his passing. He passed away a year ago. Um, his name was Eliyahu Cohen. He was a really incredible teacher, a mathematician, a Torah scholar, a teacher of Hasidus and Hasidic philosophy in Montreal, Canada, where many people know him there. Um, and we named our baby Eliyahu after him. He was born this summer. Um, so I'd like to dedicate, thank you, I'd like to dedicate today's Torah study in honor of his neshama having an aliyah at this time. Um, you know, when we study in, in the merit of someone, Eliyahu ben Moshe, Pakayan, right? Yeah. That's my grandfather's name. May his soul have an aliyah and may the family, all my aunts and uncles and my grandmother, um, and the grandchildren find comfort and like experience, you know, the merit of his soul and all the blessings from up on high. Um, so how does Torah study affect the souls of our loved ones? Right? Jumping back to our topic here. A mitzvah is like wrapping up a care package for the souls of our loved ones who've passed on. I'm putting it in a package for you, wrapping it up with a big red bow and sending it up to heaven and the soul is able to enjoy the mitzvah because souls can't do mitzvot in heaven. This is the world of action. Hayam la'asaisam. This, right here today, is the only place where we can get anything done. I mean, really, we can't get anything done in the past. We can't get anything done in the future. In the afterlife, souls can't really do actions. There's no bodies. So right now, right here today, is the place and the world of action. So what about Torah study? How does Torah study affect our souls? Ukumasha Kasav on the bottom of page 81. Ukumasha Kasav be'etz chayim, sharmem dalat parak gimel, shalavushe anushamas began eden hina mitzvahs, v'hatera hi amazan l'nushamas sha'asku ba'alam haza b'taras l'shma, b'tar l'shma. Ukumasha Kasav v'zara v'yakal daf reshev. So what does it say in the Zohar, in Eitz Chaim? that the mitzvot performed during your life, the good deeds, give garments to the soul in the afterlife. So it's like sending clothing for your soul. And the Torah study, which was studied authentically, lishma in this world, it's not just going to be clothing, it's going to be food for your soul in the afterlife. So what are the two things that every household needs to run properly? Meals and clothing, food and clothes, right? You know, we need clean clothes, everyone needs to get dressed every day in beautiful clean clothing, and everyone needs meals, everyone needs sustenance, everyone needs to be fed three to five healthy meals a day, depending on your diet plan. Um, I'm a certified health coach, feel free to message if you'd like a consultation. Um, but healthy food is a big part of our lives, as well as clothing. So the clothing for the soul, that's the mitzvah. 
I did a good deed. I did a favor for my fellow. I did something that God told me to do in Jewish law. And the Torah study is like the food, not just the clothing, but the food. So what happens when our soul moves on to the next world? It needs to like protect itself from the light, like it needs garments, and it also needs to absorb whatever is comfortable for it. So when we perform mitzvot, we protect our soul in the afterlife from the divine light. It's like a shield, it's like a garment. And the Torah enriches the soul's capacity to absorb revelation in the future. So when we do mitzvot and we study Torah, we're giving our soul food and clothing for the next world. And it can only be done here. It can't be done up there. Ulishma hainu kadesh lekasher nafsha l'ashem ayyadeh hasaga satayra ish kifi sikhlai page 82 kamasha kasav v'pri etzchayim um, what does lishma mean? we attach our soul to God we understand the Torah according to our mind's ability so what does it mean? we study it for, for Hashem's sake you know we're not just studying the Torah as an interesting philosophy book or something like you know, it's actually for Hashem's sake. We want to connect to God. Um, like the Greeks wanted to, the Jewish people to study Torah as a beautiful philosophy book. Like, don't keep it. Don't think of it as God's wisdom that, like, is actually enhancing our lives. Just keep it on the shelf as an interesting, you know, like any other Greek philosopher. But no, we're here to study Torah for Hashem's sake because it's godly. And we're wrapping up chapter 5 with the last few lines. Thanks for bearing with us here. We're running through the entire chapter today. Um, going a little quickly. What does it say? That the Torah is not just garments, it's also food. So food is internalizing divine light, and the garments are the sensitivity, which like cannot be internalized. What's so special about Torah study that's more elevated and holy than, or, or equal to all the other commandments? The mitzvot are just garments, where the Torah is actually both food and garments. How is the Torah? We just said the whole time that Torah is like food. You are what you eat. You study, it internalizes like a piece of bread into your system. How is the Torah also a garment? How do you think the Torah is a garment? It encompasses you in your entirety. That's and right. Fulfills all of your needs. Exactly. So it's not only coming into your life like a sponge and absorbing into your digestive system, it is also surrounding you, especially when the Kolshekin Shemaitzi Bepiv Bedibor, when you articulate the words verbally. Shehevel Hadibor Nasebuchinas Armakif, the breath exhaled into the words elicits transcendent divine lights. So the Torah says to study, but there's a special element of garment of Torah, of the transcendent divine light. How does this happen? When we say the words out loud, when we articulate and breathe life around us, it's called the Hevel, the um, the breath and we exhale and the words coming and surrounding our like the entire house right now is full of words of Torah that creates garments for the soul as well so we studied is this, yeah is this why you're not supposed to dub in completely silently that's a great question so we're meant to articulate like you said the words of our prayer that they should be heard a little bit not like completely completely silently but you should be able to like the breath should be articulated. Beautiful. So we study Torah and we perform mitzvah, godly deeds, and we, be, we empower our soul. We give our soul like a support system in this world and the afterlife. And it is Torah study in particular, and that's what chapter five of the Tanya is all about today, that Torah study is the most effective way, especially when you say the words of Torah out loud, to protect your soul, to fill it with sustenance and light. And um, thank you very much. This chapter was very um, focused on this one concept of Torah study being really special. So what better way to bond with our creator 
and to open up the book of Torah, read a little bit, and I'm sure some of us maybe comment online or if you have any Id practical ideas of how we can implement Torah study into our days, um, it definitely adds a huge benefit into our lives. Um, I'll open up the floor for questions for a few minutes. Any questions about today's subject? Feel free to message. Anybody here have any questions? Thank you so much for joining Espresso and Kabbalah. Next week we will discuss back to the animal soul and that exciting, um, you know, the struggle of humanity, of life, how to conquer ourselves. Um, any questions? We're good? All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to Kabbalah with a sip of espresso. Cheers. Have a wonderful, successful, beautiful day suffused with Torah knowledge and all of the joy that it has to offer. Have a great day.